Hello church family, it's my joy and privilege to be able to bring our second midweek devotion to you from our Canterbury Presbyterian Church building in Melbourne and the passage is from 1 Timothy chapter 4 verses 7 to 8, 1 Timothy 4 verses 7 to 8. Have nothing to do with irreverent silly myths, rather train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, Godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. Before we look more closely at these verses, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that your word is powerful. We thank you that you use it to transform us into the glorious image of our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that you would be pleased to do that even now in the midst of this situation in which we find ourselves, that we would depend all the more on your word and that we would grow in your grace. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Many years ago, before training for full-time pastoral ministry, I attended university in Sydney where I studied physiotherapy. Some of the lectures that I enjoyed most were a series by a medical and research professor on how the human body adapts to high altitude training. This particular professor, I remember, had a special interest in exploring the changes that our bodies undergo when they're put under the physical stress of high mountains, where the oxygen and air pressure is much lower than normal. In response to such training, our bodies become much more efficient in extracting oxygen and using available energy. It's why high altitude climbers usually spend a number of weeks acclimatizing at a high altitude before making their final ascent on the higher altitude of the summit. I remember other lectures at the time also learning about how the body adapts to various other kinds of training. So heavy weight training involves increasing muscle size. Sprint training similarly involves growth in muscle strength for an explosive, fast pace over shorter intervals. Marathon training, well, muscles need to adapt to be much more like mountain climbers' muscles to be able to endure for longer. So the physique of a marathon runner tends to be lean and thin and sprinters and bodybuilders have bulkier muscles. We are fearfully and wonderfully made, as the psalmist in Psalm 139 declares. While God has made it to be a very profitable endeavour to exercise and our bodies are capable of an astonishing range of adaptations for our health and improvement in our functional ability, in these two verses we have before us the encouragement to strive for that which is far more beneficial by contrast and with the rising rate of new infections and as we face the possibility of Melbourne moving from stage three to even more restrictive stage four lockdown. As we hear about people succumbing to this terrible disease and, and even dying. Well, the Lord would have us not lose hope, but rather to be greatly heartened. He says through the Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy chapter four, the beginning of verse seven, have nothing to do with irreverent silly myths. The encouragement here begins with a prohibition, a warning to have nothing to do with, to shun, to refuse irreverent silly myths. Some of the other Bible translations use the phrase old wives' tales. Now that might initially sound ageist as well as sexist, but not at all when it's properly understood. The word is literally old womanly myths. They are of the kind that in the Greek culture of the day, grandmothers might have told their grandchildren made-up stories, fables, tales that might entertain but were without substance. Well, we all know that fairy tales have a place for young children to stretch their imaginations, but the problem comes when such excitement without substance begins to occupy our minds. Such silly stories abound and they are more readily available now, perhaps more than ever, because of our televisions and the internet. And the range of devices that we use to access them, some of them we carry with us all the time. 
our iPhones, our iPads. Others, sometimes we can't wait to get our fingers on them to be able to explore the internet, our computers, our desktops. In our physical isolation, a particular temptation that has increased is to explore the internet or flick through the television channels. Not that doing such things is wrong in and of themselves. Both endeavours can be useful in their place. But we also all know that they can sometimes be harmful. When we allow our minds to be filled with silly stories, we open ourselves up to worldliness and the self-destructive indulgence of our own sinful desires. Whole hours can easily be spent doing the opposite of what the Lord instructs us to do in shunning such profane and unprofitable details. The contrast, says the Lord through Paul, is to train yourself. That original word is from where we get the term gymnasium, and the training is for godliness. The makeup of the word again helps us. Literally, it's two words put together to mean good awe, or fitting reverence, or worship. We're to train ourselves in this because it is valuable. It's profitable in every way, having promised both now and forever. Well, may we ask, how do I train myself in having a good awe or fitting reverence or worship of the Lord? Godliness, that is. The answer comes in the immediately preceding part of verse 6 that also talks about being trained, in particular, in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. It might sound a little like this is a thing that's contrary to grace, that if we do our part in reading the Bible, that we'll earn God's favour, that we'll merit his goodness. But that's not the case when we look at the way the Apostle Paul uses that word godliness in the previous chapter especially. In verse 16, He said, great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. Jesus is the embodiment, the personification of godliness. By faith, as we look to him, He is the one who transforms our spiritual exercise of growing in godliness, of filling our minds with the word, with his word, and putting it into practice, making it a discipline of grace. I came across a timely quote by Canadian Bible teacher Don Carson, who said, Where there is no passion for the word of God, other passions take over. Where there is no passion for the word of God, Other passions take over. We could also turn that around the other way, where there is a passion for other words, the word of God in our lives gets taken over. Where there is a passion for other words, the word of God in our lives gets taken over. And so even now, we can not just overcome the temptations unique to this growing pandemic situation, but we can flourish as we strive for godliness, knowing that we can do it with the power of God's word and his spirit, by the grace of the risen and reigning and one day returning Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we do pray that you would forgive us for those times when we fill our minds with silly stories. Our Lord, we thank you that you're in control of all things, even this situation in which we're in. We pray that you would help us to redeem the time, help us to strive for godliness by meditating increasingly on your word and putting it into practice. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Saviour. Amen. May the Lord bless and encourage you in this difficult time. Our prayers are with you and we know that we will get through this by the grace of our Lord.